We're about to hear from Cormac McCarthy about the mythology of the desert. And I've been a desert dweller my entire life. And so once we hear from Cormac, I will expand on Cormac's use of the desert in his literature and talk about some of the points he makes about the mythology of the desert. And if you guys don't know, this channel is nearing 100 videos just like this, if not way longer, on Cormac McCarthy. Click above if you want to see that list of videos. And also add me on social media if you want your feed to be filled with educational videos from me. So let's hear from Zormac. And what about that environment for... I mean, I think there are places where you can think. Well, well, no, I mean, we talked know, about this yeah. because a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of the religions, a lot, a lot of the serious, a lot of mathematics, a lot of serious thought about life started in the desert. There's something about the desert that uh, seems to uh, make people think about things. Is that true? I don't know, but it seems to be true. Yeah, yeah. And what, and what, what do you think is going on? The sort of the austerity? Yeah, I think it has something to do with austerity. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's you, you, much of your recent work is in deserts. The desert yeah. is a big part of you. Yeah. It's, it's you know, somebody wrote a book about a German guy some years ago, but it, it, in the book, I think the book is just called The Desert, but the opening, I think the very opening of the book is uh, The Desert is the most loved environment. That could be true. Yeah. You, don't, you, don't, you don't get the same attachment to swamps and forests and things, yeah. or even mountains, all the mountains. Are, yeah. But there's something about the desert that uh, is very, uh, very moving to people, always has been. And, you know, and I think, again, I mean, I th both of us have this interest in, you know, monasteries and mountains or these isolated communities that, yeah. that are very um, focused and free from a lot of the nonsense that goes on everywhere else. And it's sort of interesting. I mean, sort of scientific pursuits, religious pursuits, they share that. I mean, most institutes, great institutes are sort of, as you say, the Institute for Advanced Study Studies is in a forest. I mean, yeah. Santa Fe Institute's on the top of a mountain. I mean, yeah. the Salk Institute's on the precipice of a cliff looking to the ocean. Yeah. It matters, right? And, I, and so I'm just, you know, why are we drawn to these remote places and why do we think better in remote places? Yeah, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's certainly something I've thought about, but mm -hmm. I don't know why. I, there's just, the, the desert in particular, I mean, if you think about science, I mean, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of mathematics, um, originated in, in the Mideast, you know, in a very mm. sterile looking environment. Mm. Uh, the Greeks were not that great at mathematics. They didn't, they didn't understand that, that you could have more than three dimensions, for instance. They, you know, their mathematics is pretty primitive. But the mathematics they inherited, you know, algebra is, is an, an Arabic word, al-Jabar, whatever mm. the guy's name was. Um, so, well, I, you know, if you go back to the pre-Greeks, you, you, you really get rich mathematics, but Greeks were better at writing it. The Greeks that we know and love, they're better at writing plays. Right. You know. Right. Yeah, no, it's interesting whether there's an environment. I mean, they were, I associate the Greeks with cities, with city-states, and yeah. as you say, the, yeah. these other cultures much more with, with, with desert and um... so yes there is an austerity a severity to the desert but what does that sternness manifest because a desert is an invisible landscape there is no plant or animal life to take you away from the inherent magic of the earth and when an acolyte starts to spend time in the desert. Their brain is chattering. It's much like starting a meditation practice. And we know things like this because of books like this, The Wisdom of the Desert by Thomas Merton, which is a study of Christian desert hermitude. And so when you're given a canvas, you're going to project your feelings and emotions onto it. But nature, and especially a desert, is very non-hierarchical in the human realm. Obviously, everything and all the animals, plants exist in a hierarchy, including yourself as a human, but there are no man-made hierarchies. That's what I should have said 
said, out in nature. So all the endless loops and problems that you've created in your mind eventually unravel out in the desert. And it is faster, once again, than if you are in an environment that has more action because you're forced to do it. There is nothing else to do. It, there are extreme weather patterns, heat, wind, and even cold. And because of this forced meditation, we see, as Cormac was saying, a lot of the best mathematics, religious revelations, and art manifests out of the desert. The civilizational stuff does better in seafaring and tropical locations. Greece, Italy, Paris, London. These are places that are very green and get little to no snow. And so five of Cormac McCarthy's novels have take place in the desert or have a part in the desert. The whole border trilogy taking place in the New Mexico borderlands and the Chihuahua Desert. Blood Meridian, which takes place in the Chihuahua Sonoran Deserts. No Country for Old Men, which is west southwest texas and then the passenger briefly when alicia is in tucson which by the way cormac lived in tucson and that's why he included just for a quick fact that was the first place he moved to so when cormac left uh knoxville like cornelius Sutri, he didn't move to el paso immediately he lived uh, i think a year or so in tucson and that's why he includes the San Xavier Mission, which was built in 1698 and Blood Meridian and a lot of the surrounding Tucson area. And that's why seemingly Alicia goes to Tucson. And so Cormac is one of these writers and his writing changed him as an individual. He breaks up with his second wife, Annie Delilah, and moves to the desert. There are accounts of him spending a ton of time not even writing. There are friends who've said that they would travel down into the Sonoran and Chihuahuan Desert down in Mexico and they'd be spend a month or two down there. And Cormac wouldn't even be writing. He would just be observing. He wasn't taking notes. He was just trying to absorb as much as he could. And Cormac almost... You know, why did he mention that, you know, there's a love for the desert? People have this love. He did, you know, obviously he read that in a book, but Cormac had lived in Knoxville, which is very beautiful. He lived in Chicago. He had um, in North Carolina. He lived in Europe for years. He had an opportunity to settle in England, Spain. Like that was a wide open horizon for him. But he chose to move to El Paso, Texas for, I think, 25 years. And I don't know if you guys have ever been to El Paso, but the only redeeming thing is kind of the desert landscapes. Obviously has an old town feel and it's super cool. So Cormac seems to have had one of these desert rebirths himself. And so desert mythology is very expansive, but not talked about very much. And I would recommend everyone go check out the book Sacred Desert by David Jasper if you want to deep dive into the mythology of the desert. I'm going to just talk about, and we're going to continue, but I want to give some book recommendations because it's a book channel. Obviously, the most famous desert literature of all time is the Dune series. Everyone's got to check them out. Don't listen to what anybody says. All six books are wonderful, must-reads. And they embody a very similar approach that the desert people, the Fremen, are very austere. However, they seem to have the deepest spiritual system of the whole Dune verse. And within them, they have an activated power. They are ready. They have built themselves into this inherent power that just has to be realized. All it takes is a conscious mind in Dune, a prescient mind, I should say, Mujadib, you know, Paul, to activate the whole desert. And what happens in Dune? Like, not this isn't a spoiler. But they start to eventually, after book one, you know, grow things on the planet. And at some level, that leads to its, well, I should say, it leads to problems in the future of the novel, in the series. Another great novel, one of the best series out there on the desert, even though it's fiction, even though it was presented as nonfiction, are The, t the Teachings of Don Juan by Carlos Castaneda, the whole Don Juan series. Obviously, Don Juan didn't exist and Carlos Castaneda was making it up, but he did spend a lot of time down here. He was living in Tucson and talking to the Akai Indians and almost everything that he says checks out in terms of like shamanism. So it is a fictional tale, but he was an anthropology PhD student who was studying the Akai and the Totona Odom and all the other tribes and integrating a lot of the messages into this story that was eventually used for him to become a cult leader and whatnot. But it's a wild story and has some of the best descriptions of the desert, desert spirituality out there still to this day. I would say nothing even comes close. If you're trying to learn about how to approach and use psychedelics, how to become a spiritual person that's not some woo-woo person and, and actually connect, that it's still one of the foremost guides. And my story with the desert is that in high school, I ran cross country and we were out in the desert every single day, all year, running after school, before school, whenever. And I knew there was an, an inherent power there. I knew I was being released and freed and other kids who lived inside the city, not on the outskirts, who had to run on cement and in the city, they weren't having the same experience as I was. But then after high school, I started going out there again and I started walking. 
I just started walking because I was like, dude, all this running, I never noticed anything. And a cleansing of sorts started to happen. Everything, as I talked about earlier, started to be pulled from me. All my family trauma, self-doubt, all that was starting to be erased. But it came with a price because the price is the severity of the desert. When you are out there, and I started spending a lot of time, so I became so obsessed with the desert and its an impact that I started spending days and days out there. I really, I wasn't working jobs back then. I, I had a, I have an SUV and I would be, I would sleep out there. I'd be, I'd just be reading and writing out there. I was like, why would I read and write in my house when I could go out and do it with a view? Or, and I was following the guide of these Christian hermits and, and whatnot. And what it did was transform me into this person I am now. It was the pivotal shift from me being a little bit more of an introverted, an asshole to a path that was much more heart oriented. But it also polarized, it polarized me from everyone else because most people, when they viewed the desert, they viewed it as this dead thing, that it's boring. I grew up in the desert and everyone I know doesn't care about it. They talk shit about it. And all throughout this period, I started to write desert poetry because as I was talking about earlier, the desert is a blank canvas for you to do art on. When you write about it, it can bring up anything. It's really easy to jump from the unconscious to the conscious, especially with a nature eco poetry or prose focus because there's nothing there. And contemplating why algebra and the Middle Easterns, you know, I people always say like, why did why did Algebara, who, you know, all that, the whole crew figure out all these mathematics in the Middle East? And they're like, well, it was so hot, they had to sit inside all day. There was nothing else to do except math. And I really don't think that's true. I think that they had a better opportunity to understand the earth and the, like, the patterns and foundations of reality because there was less interference. There were less problems. Even when it's really hot outside, you can still go outside. When it's 10 below, you can't really go outside and it's cold all night. You know, in the desert, you can still, even in the worst of times, you can be outside at night. You just sleep in the day. Then at night, you can go outside. And that promotes a deep sense of spirituality and also pinpoint thinking. Why is the Santa Fe Institute out there? They were talking about these reclusive places. And so these are just my thoughts on the desert. I think that McCarthy uses the desert in his novels to show in it the inherent violence of nature by removing everything. It gives a bigger platform to display the evil energies that are present in Blood Meridian, No Country for Old Men, the whole border trilogy. So next time you're looking to book a vacation, maybe look into some of the desert towns of the United States, but please do not come in the summer.